Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and as you can probably guess today we are checking out an Apple IIc. No, gross, of course not. Today we are looking at the Compact Presario 5522. These are part of Compact's all-in-one range from the mid-1990s and uh, you may actually recognize this particular machine from another channel because uh, Mr. Lurch's things actually looked at this machine a couple of years back on his channel so I'll link that up there if you're interested. Uh, what he did was upgrade a few of the components inside and pretty much made this a decent DOS gaming machine, which is fair enough. Now, I was kind of jealous that he had this thing because growing up in the 90s, we actually had a Compact Presario just like this. It was actually the CDS524. Same form factor. Uh, the biggest difference was it had a 486DX2 running at 66 megahertz. The 5522 is a Pentium class machine and it came with a Pentium 75, which Mr. Lurch upgraded to a Pentium 133. Uh, he also stuck in a whole lot more RAM. So I think this thing has 72 megabytes total rather than the stock 16, I think it came with. Uh, the uh, CDS524 only came with eight in total, if I recall correctly, and uh, it had a 512 megabyte hard drive, whereas I think out of the box, this thing came with a one gigabyte or maybe even a two gigabyte as stock. So uh, they are very similar, but this one has obviously got a little bit more grunt to it. Now, what I'm really keen on is to restore this back to its original settings. Uh, Mr. Lurch had some issues with the hard drive and he had to wipe it. And uh, he pretty much threw in a compact flash card and a network card, which also gave him some trouble. And um, while that's cool, if you want to do DOS gaming, I really want to see this thing as I remember it basically. So bringing it back to its original stock configuration, at least in terms of the software side. But before we get into all that, there are actually a couple of issues that I found with this machine that we're gonna to need to sort out first. So this video may end up just being a repair video and we may look at the software side of stuff in the following video. We'll see how we go. So let's power this thing on. And yes, I have slowed down the uh, shutter speed on that camera to properly capture the CRT. But um, once it eventually warms up, everything looks pretty normal. It's going to count up the RAM, um, which is 72 megabytes. So I'm just going to skip that. Otherwise, it's going to take forever. And while we wait for this to do its thing, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Kent Wallen, who recently joined the Captain Blood tier on Patreon. So thank you, Kent. And also a massive thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Whether you're looking to have some of your own prototypes made, be it a PCB design or even a 3D print or some CNC machining, PCBWay have got you covered. They also have a great shared project section where you can find all kinds of things from other creators, including some stuff geared towards the retro PC world. So be sure to check out PCBWay and we thank them for sponsoring this video. And we get an error that the system options are not set and we should get another error. Time and date is not set. And what you'll see here is that these machines actually auto configure the BIOS settings when they can match up, you know, certain disk drive types and all that kind of thing. So they are pretty user friendly for a mid nineties PC compatible. And um, the actual BIOS settings are accessed by either a floppy setup disk or they're stored on a hidden partition on the hard drive. But I don't have any of those things right now. So I have to rely on the auto configuration that we've got here. With the system options and time and date not set, I can tell that the CMOS backup battery in this thing probably needs to be replaced. So that's one of the things I want to sort out. It's actually not doing it at the moment, but it does sometimes come up with another error and that is to do with the sound card. Let's just see if we get it this time. No, it's not gonna do it. But uh, occasionally I'd get a 1201 error, which was system audio address conflict detected, which is kind of weird because as I said, these are an all in one machine and it actually has the uh, sound card built into the motherboard along with the video card. So uh, I don't know how that really happens. I'm thinking that it could be bad capacitors because it seems to pop up more often after the machines warmed up a little bit but I definitely want to sort out at least these two issues before I go trying to reinstall an operating system on it. So uh, let's get this thing pulled apart and take a look inside. This should just pull out and you'll notice that there is actually a compact flash card there and that was added by Mr. Lurch for um, future proofing and convenience features, but it does mean that I need to 
disconnect it before I can pull this tray right out. All right, and this is our main board. It also has a little door to board that actually is in the front of this machine and that's where our drives connect to. And I think it might also contain some of the stuff for the speaker drivers, possibly even sound card related stuff as well. So we might have to look at that. But uh, first of all, I wanna tackle this battery and it looks like it's just over here. It's a little three volt lithium cell. So that is always a good thing. And these are the two 32 megabyte SIMs that Mr. Lurch put in. And uh, there is also eight megabytes built onto the motherboard. And it looks like a little tag has fallen off. Oh yeah, these are from an Apple. There's also a modem in here. Uh, it's a series 550K. So I'm guessing maybe a 56K modem. And uh, here's the little network card that Mr. Lurch added and a little compact flash adapter. So uh, in order to get to this battery, we'll need to remove these cards first. I won't worry about the uh, modem that can stay in there for now. It's not really gonna do anything anyway. And uh, if I take it out, I'm gonna end up with a hole at the back of the machine. So it can stay there. So they can come out. All right, that gives us access to the battery, which uh, is soldered in by the looks of it. It's kind of annoying. Uh, and there is our main audio IC. It's an ESS audio drive, ES1788F. So maybe there's, I mean, these capacitors all appear to be okay. But uh, maybe there is an issue with one of them. Uh, I guess what I want to do first is just get this battery out so we can figure out how to replace it. And that means getting the rest of this board out. So I will have to remove our modem anyway. All right, that's out. This should be able to come out. And then there's a couple more screws and then we should be able to get this entire board out of the uh, chassis. All right, so this should just lift out. Nice, and uh, probably needs a bit of a dust. We'll get to that. And here is our main board. And uh, yeah, everything looks pretty good. I'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary, but uh, as this uses just a coin cell battery, uh, we don't have to worry about any battery leakage. Let's get this coin cell out, which yeah, is soldered in. So it's like spot welded on this little plate here and no doubt spot welded on the other side as well. In fact, let's just look at the voltage on it. So if we go between there and there, we have a massive 0.33 volts. So if it was 10 times that, we'd be fine. Oh, that one came out. We just need a little... That one's fighting me. Let's try this one. Yeah, they're both fighting me. Just gonna throw a little bit of fresh solder on here and try again. Seems to have worked. It just dropped out the bottom. Nice. That is our battery removed. Let me see what I can replace that with. All right, I've got these things, which I think I bought to replace the battery in a PlayStation 2 Slim, which I'm pretty sure I lent to Mr. Lurch. Huh, funny that. Anyway, uh, this might work. It's just a little coin cell with obviously a little plug on the end, but uh, we should be able to adapt this. And there's a little double-sided adhesive thing here so we can stick it down. It's pretty much... Uh, yeah, with a bit of work, it should fit in that same location. I just need to sort out the wiring. So on the original one, our positive terminal goes to these two points here, and the negative side goes to this one in the middle. So I've just got to match that. I'm just going to cut these one at a time because I don't want to accidentally short the battery by trying to cut both at the same time. Just wondering if these two points are already connected. Yes, they are. So I don't have to worry about trying to connect wires to both those. One of them will be enough. So that's in. So I'll just wire up the positive side, I guess to here will be fine. 
We'll solder that in. And we'll just close up that little hole while we're there. Cool, that should be our CMOS battery installed. We'll just stick it down. Probably could have shortened those wires a bit more, but meh, it's fine. Right, that's that done. Now, the audio issue. So these caps look okay. I mean, I guess if anything, this one would be the most suspect as it's just near the, uh, the IC, but I don't see anything wrong with it. In fact, I do see something on that IC there on this pin over here. It's a different color to the rest. This is a job for the microscope. Right, so here's our ESS audio drive and somewhere over here, yeah, look at that leg there. It doesn't look healthy. Let's have a look around the rest of the chip. There's a little splodge of something there, but I think that's probably just flux or something. Yeah, nothing to worry about there. Some of these vias don't look fantastic. Maybe they were supposed to have the solder mask over them and they just haven't taken that well. I think they're okay. Yeah, so all the other legs look fine. Let's just go near one of these capacitors. Yeah, I don't think they've been leaking. There's no obvious signs of leakage there. If we go over near where the battery is, I don't think that cap's been leaking either. Yeah, okay, so it's just this odd looking pin here. Let's just give it a poke. Bunch of hair and crap everywhere. All right, maybe that was just a bit of crust on there. Crusty. Give it a nudge, make sure it's attached. Oh yeah, it's not moving. So I think that's okay. It was just a bit of crap on there. Would that have caused the issues I was seeing? I don't think so. And so I've just been around the IC, just making sure all those legs are properly connected and they all seem fine. No, nope, I'm not seeing any other issues on this board, at least nothing under the microscope. But um, I do kind of think it's like temperature related. It seems to happen more often when it warms up. Um, maybe it's still a bad cap. Maybe it's this connector at the front here, which goes to the little daughter board. Probably should pull that out and inspect that as well. I'll just check a couple of these caps, make sure they're still in spec. So we've got bunch of 25 volt 100 microfarad caps over here so that's pretty easy to check hopefully we can do that while they're in circuit 74 mic with an ESR of 2.2 ohms on that one so that is out of spec but that could be because it's still in the board there could be something else interfering with that the other one over here reads 99 microfarads with an ESR of 0.5 ohms, so happy with that. And these two down the back here, 99 with 0.05, 99 with 0.05, wow, they are very similar in spec. Let's have a look at these guys over here while we're at it. Uh, it's another 100 microfarad there. We get 234 microfarads with an ESR of 0.3, but I think that's, it looks to be on a power rail, so it's probably in parallel with this thing. The purple guy is a 150 microfarad. So yeah, between those two, they certainly look to be in parallel. This one actually reads 3.27 millifarads, so 3,300 microfarads thereabouts. That's a 2,200 microfarad in the middle there. And that also reads 3.2 millifarads. So 
Hmm, maybe that's in parallel with this one. An easy way to confirm that. Let's just see. All right, so those two sides are connected. Those two sides are not. I'm guessing this is all our negative rail. The positive side of these caps. Yeah, okay. So the big 2200 microfarad one is in parallel with the, uh, the small 150 microfarad but not with this 100 microfarad. So given that we have more capacitance on these three, at least when they're soldered into the board, I'm gonna pull them out and test them out of circuit. And uh, also this one here is reading out of spec, but again, that could be because they're still soldered into the board and there could be a whole bunch of other things interfering with our results. So best to take these out just to check them out of circuit, make sure they're still within spec. Did they mark the positive side? They've marked the negative side. Okay, that's good. It's always worth checking that before you pull capacitors out. All right, let's check these three. So our big one, 2.14 millifarads, so 2140 microfarads with an ESR of 0.6. Dare I say that's okay. This little one, yeah. 101 microfarads with an ESR of 0.1. That's very good. And that's a 100 microfarad cap. And this one, 176 with an ESR of 0.3. And this is, I think, 150 microfarad cap. But, uh, you know, that's within 20%. It's about 10% high, but that also seems fine. All right, so those three caps are good. Let's just check this one out of circuit, make sure it is also okay. We have yeah, 76 microfarad and an ESR of 1.1. So this cap is shot. It's supposed to be 100 microfarad and the rest of the caps on the board still read good. This one does not. And yeah, I wonder if that is somehow related to our audio circuitry. So there is definitely a connection from the positive side of that cap to our audio IC in a few places. So it might be power filtering for this, possibly some other things around here, but um, I definitely think we should replace it with a fresh one. Here go, here's a nice Rubicon, 100 mic, 25 volt, 105 degrees rated. And let's see. 93.7 microfarads with an ESR of 0.4 ohms. So still within the 20% tolerance. And uh, this one is just outside of that. Beautiful. I don't see any other issues with this side of things. Um, I don't know if I should just fire it up again and wait and see if that issue comes back. I'll be back. In fact, while I've got all this out, I might just dust off this board a little bit and uh, get a couple of photos and uh, submit them to the retro web just in case nobody's done that yet for these machines. So I'll do that and then we'll come back. We'll see if we got this audio issue again or not. Alrighty, the computer is reassembled and if we power it on, I have already set the uh, time and date on this thing. So that was yesterday that I did all that. Uh, so with any luck, it should have remembered all those settings and it shouldn't give us any errors. Cool, and we get non-system disk error because uh, I disconnected the compact flash card and that's where all the operating system stuff was. Uh, the reason I did that is because I wanna remove this front panel and uh, just swap around some of these drive configuration just so I can set all this back up to a more stock configuration and I can always use the compact flash card to copy files from other computers. So let's get this bottom panel off and for that we need to unplug everything and turn the machine over. So underneath the front panel here are two screws. They're Torx bits, but they are slotted. So you can use a flathead screwdriver to get those out. And with those two screws removed, we should be able to remove this front panel. I do want to be somewhat careful because this was previously broken. I'd have to just lift the machine up a little bit, which is awkward. So um, yes, this was previously broken in a few places and uh, Mr. Lurch uh, mended it, sanded it, 
repainted it and uh, it looks almost like new. The badge is coming off a little bit, but I can easily fix that up. What I wanted to get to though, of course, is the stuff in the front here. Let's see if we can prop this up a little bit, get a better view in there. All right, so yes, everything in here is very compact. And uh, we've got our little floppy drive, our optical drive, and the main hard drive here. And here's where everything connects to the little daughter board at the front. Uh, so I think if we remove these, that should allow us to slide this out. So I'm just gonna unplug all this stuff. And yes, that is the machine serial number on the top of that drive there. Uh, I'll explain why I've written that there later on. So the compact flash isn't plugged in, so I should be able to pull these out for now. They are stuck. Uh, I'm gonna need to remove the back. Right, that's better. So this is the little power connector that goes back to the compact flash card and uh, obviously Mr. Lurch just bodged it in. Uh, that's perfectly fine. I'll probably end up redoing some of this because now that I've kind of pulled on it, I've kind of messed up his work a little bit. But um, that's all well and good. And here's the big long IDE cable that also goes to the compact flash. I'll worry about this stuff later. Uh, I'm not gonna be using the compact flash just yet. So uh, what I might do is just disconnect this for now, just so it's not flapping about in the breeze and then I don't end up accidentally shorting something. All right, that's sort of back to normal for now. So to get at this board, it might be a bit of a challenge. Um, let's get this other panel out. All right, there's our little floppy drive. Disconnect that for now. Managed to disconnect most of the connectors, but I can see that there is what looks like a little voltage regulator down there, which is screwed down. There's no way I can get to that screw like this. It looks like we can drop this whole bottom panel out. There's a couple of screws up here, but there's also a bunch hidden under this plastic shell, and this is all one piece. Yay! So I'm gonna lay this flat on its face, making sure that there's nothing on the bench to scratch up the CRT and start removing some more screws. So with those four screws removed, I think the back might just slide off. Of course, usual warnings apply here. Uh, CRTs can contain high voltages even after they've been powered off. So uh, don't mess around with this if you don't have to or if you don't know what you're doing. So with the plastic shell out of the way, we can now get to these screws and I think that will release this whole bottom panel, including the daughter board. Now there's only the two screws at the front. Let's flip this again carefully. Okay, with any luck. Ahaha. Gives us a little bit more room. I've just got to disconnect the uh, main power connector. Which is a challenge in itself. Cool. So there you go for anyone interested. That's what it looks like underneath. There's a fan up there. Compact model number C9J0298, part number Blah, 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 that is about it. And we can focus our attention on this board, which uh, is quite dusty. Obviously this has probably never come out of the case before. And uh, there are a couple more chunky capacitors that we can check as well. There's also a couple of unpopulated spots here. This one says MDI2. This one just has an arrow pointing to it. It looks a lot like a VGA pin out though, and the traces do seem to head over to these two connectors, which I'm pretty sure are the uh, connectors for the actual CRT. So it's possible you could add external VGA, I guess, which would come in handy for capturing the screen on this thing, because my camera just cannot capture whatever the refresh rate of this thing is. I 
it might be like 72 or 75 hertz, which my camera does not like. All right, can we take this little board out, give it a closer inspection and a clean up, and uh, I'll obviously get some more pictures for the retro web. All right, the board's received a little bit of a clean. I didn't go too crazy on this thing, but um, yeah, it's good enough. Now, I did notice there were a couple of odd looking traces around this capacitor here. They seem to have gone slightly dark. So I do want to check those out under the microscope just to make sure they haven't gone bad. Looks like there's a couple over this side too. So let's bring over the microscope, have a quick look. Or oh, before we do that, we should, probably should test these caps, I guess. So we've got 2200 microfarad 16 volt here. Yeah. 2280.6 ohms ESR. And there's another 2200 over here. A little bit high, 0.3 ohms ESR. Uh, still within 20%, so I think they're okay. And the ESR is not off the charts, so yeah, they seem fine. So maybe this hasn't leaked. Let's get a closer look. All right, here's our capacitor. And yeah, you can see that trace just off to the right of it doesn't look too great. And that heads over to the video connector, which has also got a couple of mm, off looking traces around them. So, um, well, we still have video output, so maybe they're all okay. And looking over here somewhere, yeah, the outer traces on the right hand side look a bit spotty as well. And those couple of inner ones there too. They seem to head up to the CD-ROM audio connector. So I wonder if that's actually working at the moment. The rest of the board appears okay, so I'm just going to tone out those traces, make sure they're still intact, and then uh, I guess reassemble. Right, from what I can see, everything is still good here. We still have a connection to the CD-ROM audio header. And uh, the two traces that head towards this cap are connected to these two inductors. That's still all good. And uh, yeah, all these traces that go through this uh, VGA connector up to this video header are also still intact. Um, I guess we could populate the VGA header because it does seem to match up with the color coding that they've used back here, which is red, green, and blue, and obviously some grounds in between. And then they've got uh, horizontal and vertical sync and a couple more grounds. So I guess it would be possible to populate that with a VGA connector, but I don't think we'd be able to safely drive the CRT display and an external display off the, uh, the same connection. I guess if you really wanted to do it properly, you'd either need to buffer those signals for the external connector, or I guess put in a switch to switch between internal and external. But I guess you'd need at least a five pole switch to do that. So uh, that's not gonna happen in this video. Um, I'm pretty happy that all the hardware appears to be okay. We obviously had a bad capacitor and a flat CMOS battery. But apart from that, only a couple of things looked a little bit iffy and they all turned out to be okay. So I'm guessing when I reassemble this thing, I'll power it back on, make sure it still works. If it doesn't, we'll come back and take another look. Uh, but apart from that, we might leave this video here. Leave this video here. Well, it turns out I may have jinxed myself. Uh, I had this machine reassembled, it was back up and running, everything seemed to be fine, and I started to work out how to reinstall the original software on it. And um, while I was doing that, I thought, well, I need a better way to capture the uh, video output from this thing, because trying to film the CRT itself isn't really helpful, at least not with that camera. So I took the shell off again, and I think I figured out a better way to uh, get VGA out of this. Obviously it will disable the internal display, but at least we'll have a clean capture for the next video. And uh, while I was doing that and trying to figure out how to route the cables out, I took the cards out of this thing and realized this capacitor looks off. This is the one that I just replaced a few days ago, well, previously in this video, and um, it seems to have bulged. I'll put up a couple of photos, but I think there is a slight bulge on top of it and it looks like it may have actually vented a little bit. 
So on first inspection, it is obviously in the correct way. The polarity is correct, so that's not an issue. And it's definitely the correct rating, or at least it matches what was already in there. Now it could be the other one was a super low ESR capacitor and this one isn't suitable for that job, but uh, it is like a decent Rubicon branded capacitor and the cap that it replaced, uh, I think they say Marcon, which I haven't heard of before, so I don't know what those are like. But yeah, it does seem to have had a hard time in there. So uh, I'm gonna need to pull this board back out and take a closer look. Uh, the pain in the ass with this thing is I can't really reassemble all this and monitor what's going on because uh, once you put it all back together, you can't really access this part of the system. So that's kind of annoying. And obviously all the power supply stuff is part of this CRT area and that connects to the daughter board, which then connects to the main board. So there's no real easy way to monitor this system while it's running. So I'm gonna pull this out again and we'll take a close look, see if there's something obvious that I missed. All right, so here's where our capacitor is. And um, I mean, there's a bit of flux on the board that I didn't bother cleaning off, but apart from that, Everything looks perfectly fine. Let's do a little resistance check. There's definitely no shorts across it. And yeah, the, hang on. So this side closer towards me appears to be connected to ground. And if we look at the other side of the board, uh, it is marked on the board with a white stripe, which side is ground. And um, that's the opposite. I might have to go back and look at the original footage to see how the original cap was mounted. So these caps look okay. I mean, I guess if anything, this one would be the most suspect as it's just near the, uh, the IC, but I don't see anything wrong with it. Son of a bitch. Uh, I guess it's possible that the, the positive side of this cap is shorted to ground somehow, but um, then where does the negative side end up because that definitely doesn't go to ground. I reckon they've marked the silk screen wrong and they've even installed that cap wrong. Let's pull it out and see what happens. And looking closely at that, I think that cap has definitely bulged uh, on the underside as well. So here's a fresh one. It's a Rubicon from the same batch. And yeah, 100%, the one that I put in there has bulged. Yeah, and this cap is now down to 78 microfarads with an ESR of 0.2 ohms. So ESR hasn't shot up. In fact, it might have gone down slightly, but uh, certainly the capacitance has lowered since we put it in. And once again, a fresh one is yeah, 93 microfarads with an ESR of 0.4. So yeah, is the board wrong or is there something else going on here? Let's do another resistance check. So from the negative side, what is supposed to be the negative side, um, about nine and a half kilo ohms and the positive side, yeah, one ohm. It's basically a short. There's probably, yeah, there's a bit of resistance in my leads. So the problem is I can't run the system to see what voltage and what polarity gets applied to this capacitor here. I'm gonna have to just poke around until I can get a confirmation somehow. Like I'd still have to assume that's audio related and maybe either that cap is backwards or maybe there should be a bipolar cap in there. All right, I need to have a little bit of a think. All right, well that didn't take long. I had a poke around at this thing and the negative side of this capacitor is connected to pin one of this TEA 6330T, which is a Philips branded IC. They've really done well to squeeze all that text on there. Uh, anyway, I looked up the data sheet for that and it is a sound fader control circuit for car radios. I suppose it can also serve its purpose in this board. And looking at the pinout and the data sheet for this, they actually have a sample circuit. Uh, we can clearly see that pin one is a power supply pin and it's supposed to be connected through a 100 microfarad capacitor to ground with the positive side of the capacitor going to pin one. What we have here is the negative side of that capacitor going to pin one. And obviously this indeed is the positive side of the capacitor connected to ground. 
So somebody compact is stuffed up here and yeah, the silk screen is backwards as was the capacitor that was installed in it. I'm surprised it didn't fail a long time ago. Looking around this board, there's a little sort of old school uh, film camera here and there's a bunch of what looks like initials around it. So perhaps one of these people is to blame. But anyway, if you have one of these machines, uh, be sure to double check the capacitor at C531 and see if it is connected to ground on the positive side of that cap, because that could be a bad thing. Um, let me clean this up again and I'll put a fresh cap in there the correct way. And capacitor number three goes in with the polarity, the negative side towards me this time. All right, that is in and I've mounted it flush to the board so I'll easily be able to tell if this one also swells up, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Just gonna make sure the area around it is pretty clean as well, just in case we spot any leakage in the future. Yeah, I think that was certainly a design mistake and hopefully that's rectified it. So, um. I'm going to leave this video here because it's gone on very long by this point. And um, yes, coming up in the next video, we will look at the software side of things. And with any luck, I'll be able to get a direct capture from this thing rather than trying to film the CRT itself. So um, I hope you enjoyed this one. And of course, a massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same links to that are down in the video description, you'll get ad free early access to all videos, including all previous material. And um, yeah, that is it for this one. So thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff. And I will hopefully catch you in the next one. Bye. Now, where was I? <laughs>